Very good. I'm happy. As I said, my name is Patrick Anderson. I'm the Director of International Capacity Development. And I will have a short presentation of the work we are doing in intellectual property uh, capacity development at PRA. First, some words about our sponsors. Well, rather my sponsor in that sense, that is the Swedish Patent Registration Office. It's the, it's the Swedish equivalent to uh, the URSP. We are managing mostly registration uh, in patents, trademarks and designs. We are a fairly old institution, ground, uh, founded in 1892, and we are based in two different locations in Sweden, in Stockholm, uh, and then 250 or 300 kilometers north of Stockholm in Söderhamn, where they manage most of the design and trademark. Uh, and so, we have a director general called Ström, Pitt Strömbeck. We have 350 employees, about 120 are patent examiners, and then maybe, I don't know, 50 or so are trademark or design examiners. We examine patents, registration, trademarks, and we do have international training programs financed by CEDA. For the time being, we have five different, uh, these kind of trainings. I will come back to you. So, what about that? Uh, and what we are mainly focused on, and I suppose that is somewhere we, maybe we can find a good way to look is that how uh, for your, uh, in your case, the, your research institute uh, go, go from, from, uh, from the investment you put in in manual labor and hard work for, for research, how to put that into useful innovations. And uh, innovation as I see it need not be uh, a commercial product. I think an innovation can also be uh, to put the research that you have done to the public in a way that they, it can be used. So it need not be a commercial group. And typically, if you're in a research institute that you publish uh, your uh, results, and that in a way could also be looked at as an innovation. And also, I noted that there was some also from from uh, the more of a, not not from a technical or a science uh, background, but also from social science background. And again, also in that area, of course, there can be innovations. We talk a lot about patents, uh, but I would say that the main intellectual property that is generated in a research institute is copyright. You you write articles, you you gather information. Maybe you create databases and all these, uh, or, or computer programs, and all these are normally protected by copyright. So that is, and, and you should also, I, no, I noticed, and, and we all do respect, Professor, you noticed we could have 100 patents. <laughs> that's great. Uh, I think that's very commendable, and I feel, really feel the energy that you put into, and, and I think that could be a amendment to all the organizations. But the, the idea is, of course, uh, uh, you can apply for as many patents as you want, but the, 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 the idea is to have as commercial successes as possible, and then maybe not always the number of patents is the most important part, even though if you have that process to make the right decisions when or when not to patent, then of course, if you have that process and you apply for 100 patents, that's great, that probably will be show a very, strength, very, very strong strength. Okay, so I will just show you the next slide here. About and this is one like standard slide uh, that we use this often in our organization. How IP, intellectual property, meaning patents, copyrights, and so on, are fixed in the value chain. So we start here uh, with research and development, and also creativity if it's it's more of a uh, social innovation. Uh, and then you have funding and body of finance. And this is like the traditional way. Of, of, of value chain. Then intangible assets are created like knowledge, reputation, and, and so on. Uh, character, and also unique technologies and characteristics. I mean, characteristics, this is normally like a gathering thing in information. And unique technology, here's probably where you may or may not patent. And then we go to innovation. And that is when you put things on the market or you put things uh, in. Uh, to the disposal of the people and for the public good, normally. And that, that leads to commercial success, and, uh, and then the lights went out. <laughs> uh, the rest, and then 
then I will, let's see what happens here. Oh, as simple as that. I should not trip on that, that's a good, you know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I take the next picture uh, while we're waiting. And that, the same value change can also, uh, chain can also be created using putting into like real IP. So, and this slide shows that. So, in all these steps in the value chain, its latent property is very important. So, for instance, in research and development, before you should engage in any research project, you should gather information of what is known. And I, I suppose you as researchers often do that. Before you start, you go in and look uh, in, in all the databases available and try to find information. And there, especially if you work with technology, Patent information is, in a, is a very important source of information, often uh, not seen. Uh, I can give you an example. When I was a student uh, studying chemistry, uh, we had one of the first assignments we got was uh, literature search. So we're supposed to find literature on a certain subject. And I found, in my example, it was, I don't know, never mind what it was about, but I found a lot of patent information. And at that point, I was a young student then, I just, everything that has to do with patents, I just disregarded and put aside, and I only focused on, 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 uh, on my, uh, the, the, the literature, so to say. Today, I'm not, and I think, I actually I thought it was a very boring exercise, <laughs> but I've changed, and I, then I worked for 20, more than 20 years with the searching information. And I also, among, when I, Done that I've also been engaged to teaching for uh, uh, doctoral students, workshops and so on, and I experienced more than once uh, that doctoral students have had a great project. I, I remember specific, specifically one project. There was, uh, it, it was in the north of Sweden, there was a university where the people were focusing on uh, plants. So that this PhD student were, were looking for an enzyme specific enzyme from a specific plant and we had this training and so on and then the next day they were all sitting down uh, under our guidance to le learn about patent information and how to find information in patent documents and uh, that person he found the exact the enzyme the exact that enzyme that he was looking for already patented in the US they had uh, sequence, it, uh, sequence it and patent it already. So first, of course, he was very sad because <laughs> he saw like three years of, of, of research just disappearing. And then, but then he said, but it's better that I know it now <laughs> than after spending another few years uh, studying. And that is exactly, I think, one of the areas where we could contribute. And that is, of course, to, to uh, learn how to use patent information because you can use it first of all to to strengthen your knowledge about the technical field you can use it strategically to see uh, so you direct your research towards things that needs that are not yet met instead of doing research on things that are already known and also you can use it for if you have a technical problem, we have examples, uh, and I can share that, uh, but not now, unfortunately, uh, on, on where so-called appropriate technology. So you you're have a problem like gathering rainwater, and then you can find in patent literature how that has been sold in other countries, and then you can use it in your own country for that kind of innovation and adapt it for your own. So that is a very important part of, and I would say almost the most important part of the patent system is the information part. Uh, yes, and then after that you do your research and then you can apply for copyrights uh, normally if you publish an article or private information patents, uh, that's the, the technical side, that's often the things that we are talking about but again, patents are normally not the most common uh, IP to use and then also I noted that there was someone working with plant breeding and in, in the platform, then also there can be plant right protection. And I know that Uganda, yes, quite recently have introduced that kind of protection in, in, in And then, when you put it on the market, 
for commercialization, trademark, design, copyright, patents, and copyright protections again can be used. And to do this very properly, I'm very glad to hear that you at uh, Macquarie University already in 2008 introduced uh, IP uh, policy and IP management structure because that is what is needed. Normally, an IP strategy and IP management to, to get to give to do structured decisions and wise decisions when it comes to deciding whether or not to patent, when it comes to pan, uh, or just publish, and more importantly, maybe when you go into research agreements and uh, you are true to your commercialization uh, uh, or true to your policy in that sense that that you are uh, making uh, the best uh, agreements possible. But because I know uh, in many organizations I met, they have, you know, you are very eager, you would like to do your research and then you would like to do it fast, and, and, and you, you find a university or private entity maybe somewhere in the north, and they are willing to engage with you, and that's very good, and you will get money, and that's fine. But then, if you read the fine lines, when it comes to the IP, often you're, you're signing off all the IP. And of course, sometimes that's a good thing, but at least you should make informed decisions when you do that. So that's typically someone, something that you could include and reason about in, in the IP uh, management such. And I haven't read your unfortunately, so I don't know exactly what it says there. Uh, What's more, and also just the, the, just the mere fact to have a policy or have a, uh, have a strategy, or just the mere fact to have that is, of course, one way of strengthening you in your uh, in your um, okay in your um, and I see in in your work. And this the next time, yeah, I'm sorry for that. Well, and then of course based on this. Why do you need research and know, uh, want to know, uh, need to know IP? Okay, first of all I would say to make use of IP to access knowledge and protect research resources. And research institutions need knowledge of IP for strategic decisions and conversation, management of intellectual assets. Note that I talk about intellectual assets because that's a much broader concept than intellectual property. Because intellectual assets is the assets that you have created that may or may not be uh, subject to IP, but at least it's something that has a value, I mean, know-how, information, and so on. And of course, for contracts, I mean, for licensing and research cooperation. And I might add, well, while I'm, I'm, I'm uh, on it, I think uh, you at the University of Macarere and in in Yandere are in a very fortunate situation, because when it comes to patent information, I know that you have quite a few so-called TISC centers, which is Technological Information Service Centers, I think their abbreviation is, but it's TISC. And by having those centers, you are you are you are, you can access also commercial patent information, which is very useful. So I, I would urge you to look into that and also make use that or or, or, or ask how much use that. So that was my introduction of, of, of IP in general. Uh, and now, uh, end of slideshow. That wasn't what I expected, actually. <laughs> uh, because now I will talk about what we are doing, all the training programs. So that was IP in general. And what are we doing? So I have to go to a As I said, so I repeat it again. We, our main task is five uh, international training programs, very large undertakings, three, three weeks in Sweden, uh, one week for 20 to 28 participants, 25 to 28 participants. We have, they are, we have of those five, two are on uh, IP and genetic resources in support of innovation, focusing specifically on the interface between uh, innovation and on one hand and, and biological material uh, in, in be it in gene banks or in the nature on one hand and how to tailor that to support innovation because in that particular area there's a lot of international obligation normally there is a lot of national uh, legislation and at the same time uh, uh, so, uh, which so to say is there to protect 
the environment or is there to protect the plant genetic resources? That is on one side. On the other side, there is the IP system, the intellectual property, the laws, the international convention and so on. And, and, and in the middle of that, it is the researcher who will try, a uh, researcher or farmer or breeder or so, that is, should be like trying to uh, navigate through all this. So that is why we have this particular thematic training. There's are two times a year. And then we have three, uh, three more general uh, trainings uh, for developing countries which are focusing on, on, on one on general intellectual property, all areas of intellectual property that is. One is more focusing on tech, tech transfer, so it's cover all IP aspects but more relevant for instance patents and, 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 and so on. And one is focusing uh, on copyright for development. So that is more focusing on copyright, uh, which is of, of course very important. Uh, uh, cre the creative sector is of course a very important uh, part of every country because that is how uh, musicians and writers and so on can make their living. So as I said, we have five different programs and, and I'm happy to inform you that all of them are open for Uganda to, uh, to apply for. On top of that, again, <laughs> We have also just started bilaterally have cooperation with, with research uh, uh, organizations together with SIGA. Unit. Research unit. Research unit. Yes. Unit, sorry. Sorry, research unit. So we have had a project, a workshop uh, in, 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 in two universities in Bolivia, in Spain. That was a challenge. I was there, but I don't speak any Spanish. That was interesting. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, but for, fortunately enough, I had colleagues fluent in Spanish, so they did all the hard work, and I just did, did some introductory parts. That was good. And then, secondly, we are now also working in an in international organization in Bangladesh, working with their IP policy. So that are, as what we are doing. And since the organizations we work with in Bolivia, they have, didn't know anything about IP. And, and similar uh, situation in, in the organization in Bangladesh. So I, th I think since you already have an IP policy and a, a structure play, uh, at place, if, if we were to cooperate, the, 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 some of the questions would probably be the same, but other things would be probably be different. So with that, I think I finalized my introductory remark. And I'm sorry if it took too long. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Okay. Any questions at this point? Uh, please feel free to, to raise any questions. So we I'm are going already going into the discussion. Yes. And before I, I, and I also I can also excuse myself uh, again since we already we didn't have know that we were so we have another meeting we have to be at. Uh, so we need to leave that uh, around so 11 or a little bit later. Uh, we will reopen for the question. I just want to inform you all, you may have heard about this, the Nagoya Protocol. Yes. Uh, so I will hand it over one to the chair, chairman of the uh, IP committee. So this is actually protecting the right for varieties, but as well as kind of uh, traditional knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, that's one of the key uh, conventions that we work with in this uh, thematic one. We are looking at the Nagoya Project called, because as, as, as uh, it said, it protects plants and animals uh, in the wild and, and also uh, protects in that sense that, that uh, 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 each and every nation who is a party of the Nagoya Protocol uh, has the right to, to uh, control access to the genetic resources. So, uh, so for instance, uh, here in Uganda, if I'm correctly informed, uh, depending on if you are going for commercial purposes or if you are going for, for research purposes, you need a permit from either NEMA or the UNSCT. Uh, and and, 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 and uh, so that's the way the access is controlled. And that also puts and or could put uh, obligations uh, for, for research and then commercialization depending on the legislation in different countries. So for instance, if someone uh, take biological material and get permits from here uh, and then travel to the European Union to, to do their research, if they are to put uh, products of that research on the market, 
they need to show that they have had the proper permits in Uganda. They also need to show that they have due diligence, so they still have the paper in order all through the research up until 20 years of commercialization. So that's a very important uh, convention. On top of that, we also touched a little bit on, on the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources, which is a, a FAO treaty which covers uh, 60 something crops that are of particular relevance for food and agriculture. So that's also very, and again, they also have this kind of access and benefit sharing arrangement. So if someone gets access uh, to uh, uh, genetic resources in that system, they also need to sign up a contract and then that has implementation on intellectual property and in the end also on commercial stations. So that's a very, uh, just a very brief uh, introduction. Yes, yes, but let me just pick up from there and make some comments particularly on the respect to um, our genetic resources. The, that Nagoya Kuala Protocol was actually domesticated in Uganda here by NEMA. Mm -hmm. And there is the access to benefit, uh, genetic resources and benefit sharing 2005 that um, spells clearly how our genetic resources are supposed to be handled. Uh, and, and one of the key things is that for every genetic resource that leaves this country, there it must be registered and known. And Council for Science and Technology is the focal point. But unfortunately, I think either because of lack of awareness or, you know, researchers are doing their own things. Before you know it, you know, samples have been shipped out and if, if anything happens because in the Western world, some of them are now aware. They will ask you, have you got a, a material transfer algorithm? and then they try to work with us. Mm -hmm. So this is a very, very critical area, and I think the directorate might want to take it up, that um, you need to see what's happening, particularly where researchers are exchanging materials, our biological materials, that we document, and they obtain what we call material transfer algorithm. Essentially, the National Council of Science and Technology will just help you to have a good agreement, you know, it's just like IP, so that you can be able to, uh, to, to follow up if you transfer materials abroad to make sure that you don't lose control, and then you follow up what's going on. Because sometimes huge potential can unfold in that very, very materials that you transfer. So I think this is a very critical area. The National Council of Science and Technology is the focal point that for every material transfer you need to have what you call material transfer algorithm. And that normally happens between institutions. So you negotiate with the recipient institution. So for example, it would be Makere um, at, the, at the level of the BC, you should actually okay, sign the agreement. And, and also from the other side, the recipient um, institutions as well signed. And this national council that helps to make sure that you know, this is very well coordinated. So I think this is a critical point that we all need to take note of going forward. Yes. Uh, you talked about uh, uh, your programs, training yes. programs, and you said that they are also open to uh, developing countries. There are some that are here. That. That's only so I was, I was wondering about the modalities for accessing those uh, training programs. Okay. Are there scholarships? Are there? Uh, are they also train? Uh, are they conducted in these regions so that they are easily accessible? No, no they, I, I can tell. You. Thank you for that question. It's very good. I, I'm, I'm sorry. It's so, it's so obvious to me, so I don't even tell it. <laughs> no, of course. No, uh, what we the process is like that. So, so uh, approximately maybe six, seven, mostly seven or more months before the training starts, mm. an application opens. So right now, actually, and I urge everybody to apply, right now there is an application open for a training. This IPN Genetic Resources in Support of Innovation is open up until the 14th of June. Uh, and after uh, the 14th, so and the, it's available on our website, uh, I can give you the link, uh, the, the application form and, and what, 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 um, what is needed to apply. But the, the important part, and then a selection process starts. So uh, CEDA ultimately decides who will come, but based on the on, on, on the selection made by uh, the Swedish Patent Registration Office, together with, and that is unfortunate that we didn't have that slide because we are also working in close cooperation with with 
with the WIPO, which is the specialized agency on intellectual property in the UN system, World Intellectual Property Organization. So it's a, like a huge organization engaged very much. And also, specifically in this genetic resources training, we also work with Swedish partners, since we as an IP office don't know like the situation for farmers and specific specificities on, on agriculture. So we also work together with uh, the Swedish Agriculture Science University, the We Effect, which is the, um, I don't know exactly what it's in English, uh, and then also a Swedish Agriculture Network. Anyway, so, so we are reaching out right now to all these different organizations, and after the application date of the 14th of June, uh, our team and, and together with Michael will set up a, a short list of candidates based on on uh, we would try to be based on the, the right type of uh, background uh, the right type of organization and when we talk about the right type of organization it's not just I mean uh, always like it's very important and that is why it's very good to be here actually because it's very important that that organization are like open for change that it, they are like in the process or have like a strategic way forward because that is where I think our efforts and the CEDA's efforts can do the most if, if there is if, if there is it shouldn't be like we have experience in a part organization past organization that just instead of have their own training with they send people to our office because then they get better training than they can give themselves that is not the idea the idea is that we are supporting change that you need in your organization on and in the area of intellectual property and genetic resources. So after that application, and that is very, also when you do the application, it's very important that you disclose a country project, an idea of what you would like to achieve when participating in the program. And that is also signed by the superior and so on, so we need that there are institutional support. Because we will not pay the project. We will support the project in the form of like the training, of course, and also we will have a mentor. But that is more like like someone in the, you, since you are at the university, you know, like a professor that can give some comments on the documents. And the, all the hard work and, and the, uh, the time allotted and the finance is on the organization to pay, so to say. So we are giving free travels to Sweden. We are giving food. We are giving training for three weeks. We want, uh, we want an engaged person that gets support from their organization to change. Uh, so that is the deal, so to say. And also, Would when, you add when, something? when you're coming back to your organization, yes. you, need to, you need to actually make the change that is needed. <laughs> yeah? So and normally, the way we have done it until now is that when, when we get the alert from the, the uh, uh, ITP courses, we send that to Professor Buinza and you share it with, with your network. This is how we have done it. And as far as I know, in some of the, the courses that you have already have, people from uh, Uganda National yeah, Council, right. from Makerere, mm -hmm. from the Statistic Bureau has been... Yeah, different, I don't think the statistics, but throughout the years, I mean, if you look at the 15 years that we have, that this training, is what I'm saying. the main, the main uh, beneficiary has been the Uganda Administration Service Bureau, the Ministry of Justice and Constitutional Affairs, University of Makerere, University of Chambo, uh, Chambo University, uh, and uh, what more, so University... So Science yes, and science and technology. And in the past, in this, his genetic resources training is a quite new one. In the past, we have also had, like, for instance, the Uganda, uh, the National Agriculture. Uh, Naro. Yeah, Naro. Naro and also Naro Green. Yeah. Yeah. You, you. So that's um, about it. Yeah, so that was, that was about the process. And then we select, and then by, I would say, some way in the end of July, the selection is made and then we inform the people that are selected and then the training starts. For this particular training we start in, in the beginning, uh, mid, end of October, 20th of October. It would be nice if you can rent your home page somewhere. Yeah. So that we have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah maybe I can write it in. Uh, we normally we receive, normally we are notified when the call is up and uh, every year. Yeah, and, uh, Can call yeah, and uh, last year I was uh, requested to nominate, I think one turned down uh, because uh, at the last minute, so 
we lost that uh, opportunity. Yeah, so when a when call is up, we, we shall, we shall want him to notify him. I can't find how to <coughs> slash. <laughs> oh, that, that's the oh, oh, yeah, I found that. Yes. So, but if I may uh, go here, my, my challenge is that uh, we know what we want, we have a plan, but I think uh, we need a little bit of support to implement this plan. Uh, getting all so well that we've had uh, the IPM office at Makerere for, for quite some time, but that office is uh, not, not uh, very active, it's not functional. Because of staffing challenge, and uh, also, of course, uh, yeah, the office, you know, suppliers and materials to have it really work. Because to have an active office of this nature, you need a team of people that cannot provide guidance to researchers. You need the legal, legal personnel there, you need at least the technology, economics, you need, you know, people that come together and uh, provide the guidance. And, 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 and devoted persons that are inspired yes. and, and, and show reach. Exactly. Yes. So I, I really don't know how we can support each other. Uh, of course, you can continue to provide the material online and then we continue with the training back home. Mm -hmm. But I still need a little bit of support. Okay. Outside the center now, I don't want to look at the kitchen because I know what she'll tell me. <laughs> yeah, you're looking at me. And I'm looking at you. I mean, since I'm oh, totally in her hands, I, I will just be. I don't know how we can problem. really find uh, a little bit of uh, support from even other sources to help us really implement these trainings because my people need a lot of information sharing. Mm -hmm. Such that we can go to the colleges, the units, mm -hmm. talk about these issues, talk about the procedure, talk about you know, mm -hmm. that support is what is it? Yes. I think it sounds like, yeah, sorry, no, sorry. Uh, um, your observation is, 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 um, is very similar to what is running in my mind. Yeah. The Ministry of Science and Innovation is of, of, of course still a young ministry, mm -hmm. but we have a commissioner in charge of. Um, Innovation and IPM. And to me, uh, if you hear what Patrick is saying, uh, we've been developing this capacity for the last 15 years. But you don't quite see these people. They come and then they disappear within the institution. <laughs> so I'm thinking like we should they should be able to form a network. And possibly we should have a mechanism because we need a ministry that brings these people together so that we can be able to harness. The, the resources rested within them because one of the things that we realized first of all, the issue of awareness about IP. Yeah. It is not only Makere, but they are doing all these research institutes. And you can't do that even if the, if the minister was, was, was fully on the ground. You couldn't do that because you don't have the staff. So I think we should put in place a mechanism where we create a database and have these people. Yeah. From time to time, bring them together and see how they can be utilized in addressing some of the challenges um, so that, you know, they are visible and then what they do is also impactful. I think I, I was thinking along that line and possibly we, we, we need to, to discuss it. Thank, yes. thank you for that input. And, I and maybe we'll come okay. back to you and ask you, can you tell us the number of Ugandans who have trained in the last 15 years, where are they, yeah. how can we get in touch with them, yeah. so that we can leverage that platform that we are thinking about and, and, and make use of that. Thank you very much, and I think it's a very valid and very important input, and I also, I can give you a happy message and a little bit less happy message on that part. Uh, uh, of course, the happy message is actually, when we are going to regionally, we also try to meet former participants. So actually, yesterday, we had, uh, and since the, this training, one of the most important parts of this training is networking. And, and, and we, when we meet uh, the 25, 27 participants, there are from, 10, 15 different countries, so they create a great international network. Then we come regionally, we also try to gather people uh, locally, uh, like, like, like here. So yesterday we had a 
what you call alumni meeting without peer review, ITB alumni. So they, so there were some 20 people uh, or so met, and they also shared. They created a WhatsApp group and so on. So they, there at least there is some sort of informal 22 people in the network uh, already. And, and, what? From Uganda. From Uganda only. That was only the people that met yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and some others because everybody couldn't make it. So there are some more of them that. And then uh, we do have the, that information about the f some almost 60 participants of RGS from Uganda. The, the sad message, and that is the, if I start on the sad note, there is a new uh, EU legislation on, on sharing of, of personal information, which mm -hmm. is a drawback. So we. Actually, we are still struggling a little bit on, on what we actually are allowed to do because a particular sensitive matter is to send that personal information abroad. So, but we can think about modalities to still facilitate uh, ways of finding that kind of network. And, 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 and that, that is one of the reasons why we, we, why we invited the people to get in that network is because we, we are allowed to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I mean, One way to go around it, this is just out of my mind. Yes. Uh, can you, so to say, add the name of key people uh, within the IP uh, environment in Uganda to that WhatsApp group. Yes, I mean, I. So, oh, I mean, oh, that's an interesting idea. I, I think this we're not only oh, we're not owners of that WhatsApp group. It's much up to that group to see it work. Yeah, but if you explore the idea yeah, with the group, uh, because this is how yeah. kind of in the normal way of yeah. sharing information. Because as as we saw you yesterday. Can do it Around it for this yeah. information yes, sharing yes, that yes. we have. And, what, what, and many other people that we met, even though they were trained in 2009, mm -hmm. they are still. Uh, I think that was the oldest, uh, like the oldest, even though we started in 2014, so it's fine. The one we had met yesterday was 2009, but. Uh, uh, they are still active, many of them, in the IT field and work with like projects in the IT field and work at the different. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, provocative comments. Louder, please. Louder. Provocative uh, comments. Yes. Provocative comments to the director from the Ministry of Science and the Commission of the Law. The lesson I have learned from this presentation is that when we are talking about Enterprise development. It's a national agenda. So when you talk about the innovation as the engine of the enterprise, and an enterprise is going to be competitive, then this IP issue becomes very difficult. And I was asking myself whether this is something that you want to consider uh, with ERP to do some uh, something different because if Makere is grappling with the issue of IP, what is happening to the rest of the country, <laughs> and you are talking about competitiveness. <laughs> the word enterprise is in the word in the mouth of everybody. So I just thought that this thing, you are really scratching a very, very important initiative nationally. And I was going to uh, the risk of working the director of the commission that the building of capacity of material should just be part of the well conceived national agenda. We have so many people who want the market, we have so many people who want the market for but we are not aware of this. How do we build on these two concepts differently and come up with a national agenda of which material we can go back to as a big brother of the system? I think uh, it, it 
was not as provocative as I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, very important, made nevertheless. I think, Prof, we have all agreed that um, uh, we need to valorize science or research for that matter. And we shared this thing, saying we are all under a lot of pressure to get, to make, to make science beneficial. And you've touched on that, the issue of job creation. And if we are talking about small, medium enterprises where these youth are running around, this is the way to go. I think that one, there is no question about it. And like you said now, I think the debate about IPR coming to this level, I think it's gone a long way. This is one of the first few times that we've had the opportunity to sit here and discuss anything. And I think it is from this point that we're going to pick up. We already had some discussion yesterday with the director, and I think we're going to pick up from that. Very useful, we don't have time to share it now, but we want to concretize the issues that we raised yesterday in our informal discussion and see how to build a bigger agenda out of it. The issues and I thank you for it. Sorry. Uh, mine is uh, uh, according, I think. I uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I just want to say I'm an alumni of the courses that have been presented. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Though I'm, I'm so not what yet. happened with your varieties? <laughs> you weren't invited yesterday. Yeah, but I can talk about what actually happened because it is beautiful. Now, um, I participated in a bio and project which was supported by SIPA. We went there, I had a project of change. It was in PVP. So, uh, so that was the previous one, the so one that was mine. And mine I was really supposed, of course, we did one in Sweden, and then we did uh, something else in South Africa after the projects. Uh, so what I just want to say, it really worked very, very well. It was in plant genetics and plant genetic resources and IP. And I found it very useful. I came the project of change. Yeah, we eventually, actually, the government, I feel very, very, very happy because eventually the PVP law actually was taken up. It was taken up by parliament and I think it was very effective. Of course, there was local support here from National Council of Science and Technology. We did workshops together, we did surveys, tried to do uh, everything together. So, the courses, are, for our case, they were very relevant and they really make a big difference. Now, the major challenge I see is with our university, because I know the director and the professor, yeah, I know they are interested, but I know they are not adequate. Because they have so many other things in there, you know, when you have, you don't have really that well big office where you come with issues of IP, you say, so there, and then they run them. But I think I want to commit that uh, these courses are very useful in making someone more competent and understanding what IP is. I think that's what I can commit. Thank you so much, Patrick. Let me start the only one to sit because my former teachers are here. <laughs> so um, I really want to thank uh, Patrick and the team for the support that you're seeking to build in this wonderful uh, institution of ours. But I wish to allay all fears among the staff that first things first. And the fact that uh, a dedicated department was created in the Ministry of Science to tell innovation to handle innovations and intellectual to handle issues, it was a step in the right direction. The IP value chain is broad. We have generation, the protection aspect, commercialization and enforcement. The National IP Office, hosted by URSB, will help you a lot in the area of uh, protection and enforcement. Matters of generation, 
and uh, commercialization. That's why we're actually going to be able to come in as a ministry to really give a hand in that particular area. And they're not the only ones, apparently. The good thing IP now presents, whether it's uh, uh, the youngest uh, university, whether the private sector, and Margaret, like, you can still now be at par. However, you remain the greatest of all. So the question is, how do you take advantage of that? So really, in order of priority, we we'll put that into consideration because they are the most high-strung university in the country, and also in Africa, really, they perform well. So the thing is, they are not too badly off. We just need to streamline a few things to make things really work. Because uh, the various colleges, they are different experts, technically, but what we can actually be able to do is how do we get them to really understand how things work? I mean, the, I mean, if you ask here, most of the researchers say how many of them use or have uh, references or patent information, patent documents as part of the references? None, possibly. Because they're always looking at uh, this other, other published material, which is non patent literature. That's what they concentrate on. So things are going to change. Even how students now are meant to, to pitch or present their vibers, something really has to change. How do you present your findings? If you're able to present them in a manner that follows the template of a patent document, then people are going to learn that if I to make a simple draft, I will know I need a summary, I need a, a description, I need a background. They will know. So it's things that really, we shall share the strategy of the ministry on how we're going to be capacity on IP in this country. We won't let you off the hook. We just have to really get on board and discuss and we see how best we can do this. We will support you. We are there to give a hand. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, can I mention one distinct step that uh, we've taken? I think we had a meeting here with uh, some team from Geneva and they had proposed that we we put together a curriculum. Of course, there is the School of Law already has some bit of curriculum on the intellectual property and all these issues, issues between uh, national systems of innovation. So probably one way to push it forward in creation, so creating capacity and awareness, is to create uh, a cocktail of curriculum embed into our system, but also like, to allow for capacity building even outside the university in conjunction with the the ministry. Uh, because this is a new area, one time when we did research, I think it's some point, of course, how that changed. There were only two patents in Uganda, and they probably now we don't know how many they are, but I'm sure they're not two. There's, there's not much change. <laughs> of course, they, they, the real, one of the real issues was that there was no clear indication of how you benefit from all this. But uh, yes, I wanted to bring in this that uh, we push forward the curriculum development in various or various stakeholders as a way, one of the big ones. I'm yes. getting sense of that. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, I know that that's, that's a very good way to go, and I know that uh, there are. are what, oh, sorry, get, No, please. I just want to add something. I, for me, it would be good to know the IP committee here that is representative from all the colleges or within that so how do you work how do you how do you so to say support the researcher on different issues that they have uh, this, or is is it the, this this is a relatively new committee you know new we've been having meeting, meeting last year it was formed the late last year okay uh, you know this policy has been placed for the last uh, 10 11 years but there was no committee to spearhead its function. So last year, the vice chancellor instituted a committee which has membership from all the colleges, all the key units. Uh, and uh, so we started off by, uh, we are now revising the policy. That's one of the targets that we have to meet this year. And the timeline is what? Uh, this year, we should be done with the, doing the policy. Then we also sensitizing the units We've had some uh, workshops with people from UL ULSB. So we're going to have more, of course, also uh, at the unit level, at the college level and the school level. And then we shall uh, also sensitize them on how to use the instruments for purposes of applying for the IPs.
that is work in progress. Yeah, it's work in progress. Yes. That's very hopeful, and I, I think that's also like that's where where it all starts to have first idea where where you go. You know, of course, we could be happy to to be more. <coughs> I, I, I didn't get the uh, uh, Madame Dutton's uh, uh, was she proposing that uh, the committee here meet this course? Sorry? Uh, Sorry? No, I'm not getting you. Come again? <laughs> uh, were, were you proposing that this committee should undergo this this training as, as an immediate uh, measure? I cannot suggest such a thing because as you heard from Patrick, this type of training, ITP courses, is in, in a competitive manner. So people from the institutions need to put application and then they have their own process. The only thing is that CEDA is funding them, but I'm not in the position to tell them who they should take in and who, who they should not take in. They have their own, we are talking about a transparent, competitive funding mechanism. Although it would be a nice idea if at least every college has somebody who has undergone this mm -hmm. training, then they would also form their own local network within the campus. I think it would um, um, add some value. Yeah. But, of course, but this is something that we cannot control. Because it has, to do, it has to do how you write your application, yeah? Yeah, yeah. What, what, uh, we may not go for this one, but what we are doing locally is uh, we are organizing trainings in the colleges. And, uh, later, at a later time, uh, Professor Inete, what we may do is that uh, if we have identified the critical areas where we need a little bit of external support, mm -hmm. then we could do uh, contact Patrick, okay, to either come over or send uh, one of his uh, uh, staff that has got competence in such an area. We, if we had the time, we've had disturbances, but we should have gone around the college, the colleges, to you know, to take stock of what exists, yeah. the knowledge levels, what is lacking, what do they need, you know, the needs assessment. And uh, once we've done this together with the uh, registration service bureau, then we should be able to come up with a clear picture of where we want to go and where we need the support, only the critical areas. And we shall be getting back to you, Patrick. Th thank you very much, uh, Professor, because that was exactly what, when I started talking, that was exactly what I thought also. That since I think Uganda is in a very good position, because Uganda has, a, as so far as I know, a very good IP office, that I think they were happy, as you see, this they were happy to engage. And, and, and I think you can do very much on, on your own here. So, 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 and also when it comes to training, I mean, Many of the participants that have been participating throughout the years <laughs> are, have done a lot of good and know so much. So I think if you can find them, and that was what you were referring to as a director, if we can find them, I think very much can be done here. And of course, we are uh, happy to facilitate. And also, there are, there are some, maybe there are some things that we are could be also engaging in more hands-on. But I think you have a lot of things here already. So just to analyze the find that the professor said. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. You still have some time? A little time, eight, I think. Eight, five, eight, minutes. Eight, uh, five, eight, five minutes. Five minutes. Eight, eight minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> Unfortunately. So I, I, I uh, should I, well, I don't have anything to conclude more or less. Well, uh, we'll use the, the, 